It was soon Christmas season, and one of my responsibilities was to close out the books for the year. It was a very hectic time for us, and one night I was asked by the president of the company to stay late, finish some work, and then lock up. That night, I worked on the books until almost two in the morning, the building, of course, completely empty except for me. I finished up, turned out the lights, armed the building's security system, locked the door, and exited. I walked through the parking lot to my car, opened the front door, and got in. There was a smell, a smell of rotting flowers, of putrid water from a neglected vase, and the stench of decaying flesh. I felt something on my neck, not fingers, but stumps, finger stumps caressing my neck. I turned around. And there were the corpses of my parents seated in the back, and they were gazing at me with wide eyes and horrible grins on their faces. I was ice cold and nauseous with terror. I opened the car door, rolled to the ground, and ran back to the building, fumbling frantically with the keys. I finally got the door open. I took a few trembling steps into the dark hallway when I felt something brush against my legs. And then do a series of. Are you familiar with classical ballet steps? The allure reporter nods somewhat. Well, it did a series of brise volées. This is a flying brise where you finish on one foot after the beat and the other is crossed in back. It's basically a fouette movement with a jeté battu, and then it landed in the middle of the reception area in an arabesque à la hauteur. That's an arabesque where the working leg is raised at right angles to the hip, one arm curved over the head, the other extended to the side. It was the monster child, and he had a birthday hat on his head. To my astonishment, especially after everything I'd heard, he wasn't such a malevolent creature after all. We talked for quite a while, touching on a wide range of issues. And then he said that he had a friend who was in trouble, and he asked me if I could help her. I said I'd try. I followed him deep into the woods, maybe two or three miles, until we stopped. And there, seated against a tree, sobbing inconsolably, was Julianne Phillips. What's wrong? I asked her. She said that Bruce Springsteen had just left her for Patty Skialfa. Listen. I've got a car," I said. "Is there somewhere I could take you?" P -p 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 Paula's. Well, it turned out that Paula was Paula Abdul, and we became very close. And it was through Paula that I met Elton, and then Axel, and Queen Latifah, and、uh, that's basically how I got started writing liner notes. Thank you very much, Mr. Laner. That was absolutely fascinating. The allure reporter gushes, and good luck on your new book. Thanks. It was a pleasure chatting. I'm frequently asked that question about how I got started writing liner notes, and I have to admit that it's become somewhat tedious explaining it over and over again. So I feel a bit pooped, and sneak off to the bedroom for a quick nap. There's an open book on my pillow. This is one of Arlene's modes of communicating with me. She'll leave a certain book open to a certain page and passage on my pillow, and I'll deduce from the text what Arlene is trying to tell me. Having read the selection, I'm initially at a loss to determine what message Arlene has intended to convey. Could she be trying to say that we should go out dancing more? Or that I have a drinking problem, or that I'm dictatorial about what we watch on television, or that I'm moody and sulk too much. Perhaps she's suggesting that I kill someone to enhance my supernatural powers, or maybe, just maybe, she's trying to say that I need to get away from the rarefied and glamorous world of my headquarters. Maybe Arlene, in all her psychotherapeutic wisdom. Is trying to tell me to return to my roots, to re-stomp the rough and tumble stomping grounds of my youth. So the next day, 
I went back to the old neighborhood to look up Rocco Trezza. Hey, man, where's Trez? You seen Trez around? I asked a guy who used to hang out with Rocco and me. The guy dismissed the question with a wave of his hand. Trez has been baking donuts, he said disdainfully. I hadn't been back to the old neighborhood for some twenty years, and obviously I was no longer fluent in the local patois. But I didn't want to ask what bacon donuts meant and seemed like some kind of hick. So I just shook my head and rolled my eyes and said, Bacon donuts, oh man. I bid the guy adieu and walked down the street trying to figure out what he meant. I was so lost in thought as I rounded the corner of the street that I barreled right into a guy, didn't even see him coming. As I helped him off the ground, I suddenly recognized him, and I was so stunned that I let go and he fell back onto the sidewalk. It was Rocco. Rocco Treza. He was older, a bit heavier in the gut. His hair had thinned out, but he was unmistakably Trez. Same inimitable style, the thigh-high jack boots, the black latex jock strap, the Prussian spiked helmet strapped under the chin. Trez, I can't believe it. After all these years, Trez hugged me. How's it going, man? He asked. I'm good, I'm good. I got a hit book out. My wife got 35 grand because a ceiling fell on her head while she was watching the Academy Awards, and we got a dog named Carmella. Carmella. Yeah, Carmella. Trez, it's really good to see you, babe. Likewise. I've been reading about you. Hey, Trez, I want to ask you about something. Ask. Trez, I hear you've been... I hesitated for a moment, wondering whether I should pursue it or not. Trez, I hear you've been baking donuts. Rocco stared at me, and I could see the fury just boiling up within him. Baking donuts! Baking donuts! You heard I was fucking baking donuts! He wrestled me down and pinned me to the sidewalk. His breath hit my face in hot gusts. After all these years, after all we've been through, after every fucking thing you and me have been through, you think that I would possibly fucking end up baking donuts, huh? I threw him off me, and we both looked at each other, sitting there on the sidewalk. I still had no idea what it meant, bacon donuts. Trez, I said, I didn't believe it, okay? I knew it was a fucking lie. It is a fucking lie, he said, helping me up. I put my arm around him, and me and Trez walked down the street, and it was just like the old days. I'm sitting by my pool, which is encircled by the eight-foot, four-ton basaltic bluestone pillars from Stonehenge's inner circle that I bought with a portion of my latest advance from Harmony Books when Baby Lago brings me a fax that's just come in. It's from Stu Gallenkamp, Vice President, Marketing, Columbia Records, with regard to the liner notes I'd written for George Michael's Listen Without Prejudice, Volume 1. It says, quote, Dear Mr. L, I just got off the phone with George. He loves the liner notes, and in fact called them the most intense and in a certain sense, the most significant liner notes he'd ever read. Close quote. At breakfast the next morning, Baby Lago informed me that we were out of turtle eggs and strawberries. I felt like driving her new Porsche 911 Turbo, so I offered to fetch the groceries myself, and she tossed me the keys and her flame-resistant driving gloves. I negotiated the concrete anti-terrorist road barriers in first gear, the tachometer needle climbing towards the 6800 RPM red line. I brought the car to a complete stop where the headquarters access road meets the highway. I looked at myself in the rearview mirror. Nice. 
Nena stomped on the gas, tore through the gearbox, and hit 60 miles per hour in 4.8 seconds. Approximately four miles west of Exit 16, outside of Wenton's Mill, I began following a 1983 light blue Chevy Impala Tennessee plates, traveling west on Route 70. My initial observation was of a male Caucasian driver approximately 25 to 30 years of age and two passengers, a female Caucasian and female Hispanic, both approximately 25 to 30 years of age. As I followed the vehicle, I observed its occupants engage in almost continuous sex. Approaching Exit 3 outside of Knoll, I decided to pull the vehicle over. I attached my flashing red light to the roof of my car, and the vehicle slowed, pulling onto the shoulder of the highway. I got out of my car, approached the Impala, and gestured to the driver. At the time, it was the female Caucasian, to roll down her window. She did. The smell of sweat was overpowering. Half-eaten chicken wings and drumsticks, juicy fruit gum wrappers, crushed Marlboro packs, and empty beer cans were strewn all over the car. The occupants wore no trousers or underpants. I'm charging you all with public lewdness, I said, and I looked at my watch in order to log the correct time on my report. It was 10.45 a.m., the occupants looked at me and began to speak, but they didn't use words. A soft, crackling sound, a kind of modulated static issued from their mouths. I looked at my watch again. Incredibly, it was almost 12.45. Somehow, two hours had passed. The female Hispanic proffered a stick of fluorescent chewing gum. I chewed it. When I came to, I was in a hospital room. Four days had passed. Dr. Larry Werther, Baby Lago, Joe Casal, Rocco Treza, and Carmela were pacing around my bed. I had a severe headache. Where are the bodyguards? I asked. They're out in the hall, Mr. Lena, Joe Casal said as he worked the remote control on a television set cantilevered from the wall opposite my bed. What about Arlene? She's got clients till ten. Then I'll pick her up and bring her over. Larry, what was in that chewing gum? When they pumped your stomach, Baby Lago took samples and analyzed them in the lab back at headquarters. Gas chromatography, mass spectrometry, nuclear magnetic resonance, she did the works. It was ibotenic acid, a powerful neurotoxin, destroys nerve cells in the brain. It's a good thing Joe Casal had tailed you. I gave Joe the thumbs up. Thanks, babe. Joe turned his gaze momentarily from the TV and gestured with his flipper. No problem, Mr. Lena. Joe also found this stuffed in your mouth. Larry handed me an ivory mahjong tile with the words Vote for Iron Man Wang engraved on one side. Damn. Forget about it, man. That's Hong Kong, Treza said, taking my hand in his. You can't worry about that shit now. You've got your books and your liner notes to write. That's your life, man. Not chasing Iron Man Wang and his posse of hot-wired sex freaks around the world. That's chump shit, man. That's why I love Trez. He always knew exactly what to say to make me feel better. I playfully snapped the elastic waistband of his black latex jockstrap. Trez, you know, if you ever decide to stop baking dope... Trez's eyes flared instantly. If you ever decide to stop doing whatever it is that you're doing, I'd love to have you come work for us over at headquarters. And that's a serious offer. Trez was about to respond when Joe Casale interrupted from across the room. Hey, Mr. Lena, he said, gesturing at the TV with the remote control. 
Look at this. The Brazilian actress Sonia Braga, Elle McPherson, two Victoria's Secret models, and Claudia Schiffer, the German model featured in Guess Jeans ads, were sitting around talking about what kind of man turns them on the most. I like a guy about five seven, said McPherson. The auburn maned Victoria's Secret model had shut her eyes. Her hands were crossed over her breasts as she swayed from side to side. I can even picture what he's wearing, she whispered. He's got a leather blazer on over an Oakland A's t shirt, black jeans, and snakeskin boots, McPherson growled. Yes! 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 squealed everyone. Dr. William Carlos Williams took Todd's hands in his. Todd winced. The pain's really that bad, huh, Todd? Dr. Williams asked gently. It's really terrible. Todd, I want you to think very carefully. Is there anything? I don't care how trivial or silly you might think it is, that you do with your hands or wrists repeatedly every day. Well, there is. I'm kind of ashamed. I. Todd made a loose fist and gestured up and down. Masturbation, Todd? Yes, Dr. Williams. That's what I thought, Todd. Todd. There's absolutely nothing wrong with masturbation in and of itself. It's perfectly normal behavior. About how often do you masturbate? A lot. What's a lot? Well, it's hard to count. Maybe 30 or 40 times a day. Dr. Williams smiled. Todd, have you ever heard of something called carpal tunnel syndrome? No, Dr. Williams. Carpal tunnel syndrome is a repetitive motion injury. It's also called a cumulative trauma disorder. I'll be giving you some literature about this so you don't have to remember all the jargon. In carpal tunnel syndrome, a fast repetitive motion over time damages the nerves and tendons in the hands and wrists. Is there anything they can do about it? I mean, pills or an operation? I'm going to schedule an appointment for you with my friend Herb Horowitz. He's one of the best muscular skeletal men in the business. And if, having examined you, he agrees, I'd like to schedule you for surgery. Surgery, Todd said, looking frightened. With surgery, we can take some of that pressure off the nerve. Look, Todd, first of all, I'd like to get you into a group. You know, you're not the only one going through this. Dr. Williams handed Todd a glossy brochure entitled The Autoerotic Repetitive Motion Disorder Association of America. It had a photo of a bunch of nerdy guys sitting around with various sorts of bandages and slings and splints on their hands, wrists, and arms. Dr. Williams, what if the therapy doesn't work and I can't stop? What then? What's the worst case scenario? We'll have to have you fixed. Fixed? Todd said, his voice cracking. Relax, Todd. You said it yourself. It's a worst case scenario. Now let's take this one step at a time. I want you to see Herb Horowitz next week and let's see what our next move is, okay? Okay, Dr. Williams. Thanks. Todd walked out of Dr. Williams' office with the brochure under his arm. William Carlos Williams, respected physician and distinguished poet, turned to the computer keyboard at the side of his desk and began to type, trying to compose a few lines, perhaps even a stanza, before his next patient arrived. That was great, Mr. Laner. Really great. Joe Casal said, tucking a flipper under his pillow and nestling into a fetal curl. What book is that from? That's from a book called Lives of the Poets, I said, showing Joe the cover before I turned off the lamp at his night table. Mr. Laner, 
Do you think I could borrow it sometime? I'll tell you what, babe. Tomorrow I have to be at a store downtown to sign some books. I'll pick you up a copy of your own. The book I was scheduled to sign, which had just been published by Rizzoli, was a $75 oversized volume of nude photographs of myself taken by a spy satellite in geostationary orbit over New Jersey. Joe started getting out of bed. Mr. Lena, let me give you some money. Forget about it, babe. It's on me. It'll be a token of appreciation for the job you're doing here at headquarters. Thanks, Mr. Lehner. Bonsoir, babe. I was scheduled to meet the manager of the Global Entertainment Book Record and Video Annex at 11 a.m. the next morning. As I entered the store, I was pleased to see an elaborate window display of the book of photographs, which Rizzoli had entitled The Celestial Voyeur, Heavenly Views of an Earthly Body. The manager, a knowledgeable-looking, earnest young man in sweater and tie, was assisting a customer. Can I help you? he asked. Do you carry video equipment and computer equipment? Yes, we do. Okay, there's something. I'm not exactly sure what it is. Some kind of interactive computerized laser video player or interactive digital video software or something. But it enables you to take any movie and insert Arnold Schwarzenegger as the actor in the lead role. Yes, we have what you're talking about, but you're a little confused about it. We have the equipment here. The computer, the digital video image synthesizing unit, the software, all that. We have that in the store. You tell us what you want, which films you want Schwarzenegger inserted into, and we do it right here for you. So you do it. I don't need to buy the equipment? Oh, no, 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 no. We do it right here. As a matter of fact, you can even fax your order in, and we'll deliver the Schwarzeneggerized videos to your home. Oh, cool. Can I order some now? Sure. Okay. I'd like My Fair Lady with Arnold Schwarzenegger as Professor Henry Higgins, Amadeus with Arnold Schwarzenegger as Salieri instead of F. Murray Abraham, The Diary of Anne Frank with Arnold Schwarzenegger as Anne Frank, West Side Story with Arnold Schwarzenegger as Tony, It's a Wonderful Life, with Arnold Schwarzenegger instead of Jimmy Stewart, Gandhi, with Arnold Schwarzenegger instead of Ben Kingsley, Bird, with Arnold Schwarzenegger as Charlie Parker instead of Forrest Whitaker. Can you do documentaries? Sure. There's a documentary called Imagine about John Lennon. Could you fix it so that it's Arnold Schwarzenegger instead of Lennon? No problem. So it'll be Schwarzenegger playing with the Beatles and Ed Sullivan, and Schwarzenegger doing those peace things in bed with Yoko Ono and everything? Yes, ma'am. Our equipment is state-of-the-art. Okay, and one last one. Hmm, how about Rain Man? Would you like Arnold Schwarzenegger as the autistic brother or the Tom Cruise character? Could you do it so he's both? Sort of like Patty Duke did as Patty and Kathy in the Patty Duke show? We can, yes. That may be a little more expensive, though. Well, I'll take it. And I think that's it. And thank you very much for all your help. It's been my pleasure, said the earnest young man. Occasionally, I'll conduct a writing workshop. I'm accompanied by my phalanx of bionic elderly bodyguards, some of whom are heavily armed and stationed at predetermined strategic positions within the room and building, and some of whom work undercover, posing as workshop participants. I'm also armed. Since I don't like to carry a firearm when I conduct a writing workshop, I've found that it tends to inhibit people who haven't yet developed a confident style of their own. I'll come with an ice pick in my sock. I openly brandish a cargo hook, but I figure that in the event that somehow someone is able to wrest the cargo hook from me, I'll have recourse to the hidden ice pick. First, I pose a question to the workshop participants. Do any of you think you could ever be as good a writer as I am 
or perhaps even a better writer. And would you explain why you feel the way you do? Uh, yes, over there, the fellow in the green sweater? Well, I think it's possible, although it would take just a tremendous, tremendous amount of work to reach your level of virtuosity. I think it's possible that I could someday be as good a writer as you are. At the conclusion of the workshop, my bodyguards, who've been working undercover, will take into custody each of those participants who has stated that he or she could be as good a writer as I am. Quietly, so as not to alarm those who have remained to get my autograph, the detained participants are handcuffed, loaded into the security van, and taken to headquarters. The standard procedure begins with the placing of a bag over a detainee's head. Interrogation and re-education can last from several hours to a few weeks. Sleep deprivation, exposure to cold, mock executions, and various psychological techniques are used to persuade the detainees never to write again. When the staff is certain that a detainee's re-education is complete, the detainee is branded on the buttocks with my insignia as a reminder of their matriculation at headquarters and then released. It's the antithesis of a writer's colony, an anti yado Bookstore shelf space is limited, as are the column inches available in today's book reviews. And we at headquarters are adamant in our belief that all competition, active or potential, must be neutralized. My insignia is a guy surfing on an enormous wave of lava. It's an avalanche of this lurid, molten spume with this glowering, chiseled commando and baggy, polka-dotted trunks on an iridescent board careering across the precipice of this incredible, fuming tidal wave of lava. And there's an erupting volcano in the distance in the upper right-hand corner. It's excellent. I have it tattooed on my heart. And I don't mean on the skin of my chest over my heart. I mean tattooed on the organ itself. It's illegal in the States. I had to go to Mexico. It's called visceral tattooing. They have to open you up. They use an ink that contains a radioactive isotope so that the tattoo shows up on x-rays and CAT scans. I've had many visceral tattoos since. A tip to the guys out there, they really turn on female medical technicians and nurses. I've had numerous hot relationships start because a med tech or a nurse saw one of my x-rays and went nuts over all the tattoos. They know that any wimp can go out and get Winona forever stenciled on his arm. But it takes real balls to have yourself put under general anesthesia, sliced open, have a vital organ etched with radioactive isotope ink, and then get sewn up again every time you want to commemorate that special lady. Next, I want to have the words desert, storm, thunder, and lightning tattooed on my left frontal cortex. But I don't know where I'm going to go for that one. Brain tattooing is illegal even in Mexico. Someone told me maybe Malaysia. Rocco left today. Baby Lago and I found a mercenary magazine left open on his bed with a page torn out. I was surprised, but not surprised, if you know what I mean. Lately, he'd seemed uncharacteristically subdued. He'd been talking a lot about his father. That in itself struck me as peculiar. Trez wasn't typically given to retrospection or wistfulness. But every so often, I'd find him smoking a cigar by one of the bay windows overlooking the carp ponds, and I'd say, Trez, what's up, man? And he'd gaze into the distance for a minute or two, and then he'd take the cigar out of his mouth and stare at the soggy, masticated stub, and he'd say in a hoarse whisper, I was thinking about my old man. Rocco's father had been a medical cheese sculptor. 
He sculpted cheese centerpieces for medical conventions. Tragically, at the height of his career, there was a terrible accident. Rocco's father and mother had won a sweepstakes contest and had gone to London, England. One night, they went to a pub, and the poor man, not knowing the local customs, walked where he shouldn't have and took a dart in the right temple. Rocco was at his bedside when he died. He had something in his fist, and before the body was removed from the hospital room, Rocco gently pried open his fingers to see what he'd been gripping with such poignant tenacity. It was a torn anterior cruciate ligament made out of Munster and Swiss that he'd been laboring to complete for the Canadian Association of Sports Physicians' 25th annual meeting in Ottawa. Trez kept his father's final sculpture with him always, and when he came to work at headquarters, he stored it in a special place in the commissary freezer. We checked the freezer this afternoon. The Munster and Swiss ligament was gone, along with Rocco. In the middle of the night, the phone rings. Arlene answers. She nudges me awake. It's for you, babe, she says. I take the phone. Hello, this is Mark Laner. Hi, Mark. This is Desiree Buttcake. Desiree, I'm sorry. I don't really know who you are. She laughs. Mark, of course you don't know me. Well, I mean you don't know me as Desiree Buttcake. You know me as Francine Massiello. I wrote you a letter a couple weeks ago. I'm the psychic who recently had cosmetic breast and buttock augmentation surgery. Remember? Oh, yeah. You're the Hummel collector who got carbon monoxide poisoning on American Bandstand? That's right. That's me. Well, what's up, Francine? I mean, Desiree. I want to work for you, Mark. And I want to start tonight. There are important things I can do for you and your organization, but they need to be discussed immediately. Well, listen, Desiree. Applicants for employment at headquarters usually have to undergo an extremely rigorous interview process and security check. Interview me tonight. It's critical that I start working for you as soon as possible. Believe me. Okay. Where are you? Every Thursday night, a cell of right-wing intellectuals, novelists, playwrights, poets, painters, architects, and psychics meet in the sauna of a different Jack LaLanne health spa. The location of the sauna is kept secret from members of the cabal until 9.40 p.m. on Thursday night, at which time it's announced in an encrypted fax. Let's see here. Okay, tonight we're meeting in the sauna at the Jack LaLanne Health Spa in the Linwood Mall, Fort Lee, New Jersey. I'll be there, I say. When I arrive at the Jack LaLanne Health Spa, there is no sign that a clandestine meeting of ultra-right-wing intellectuals and psychics is taking place in its sauna. I undress in the locker room, walk down a short hallway, come to a door marked sauna, and open it. Mark, over here, a woman's voice emerges from the corner. Desiree, is that you, babe? It's me. Listen, why don't we go somewhere where we can conduct our interview more privately? Okay, there's a diner across the street. I'll meet you there in ten minutes. Miss, I'll just have a cup of black coffee. Desiree, do you want anything? I'll have a scoop of vanilla ice cream with cough suppressant whip and a cup of PMS tea. The waitress left and Desiree rummaged in her gym bag, extracting a resume which she handed me across the table. Hmm, very impressive, I said, perusing her Vita. Captain of the Ossining High School track team, 
played ancient instruments in the high school orchestra, student council president, president of Thespians and Yearbook, National Merit Scholar, combined SAT scores of 1590, attended Princeton University, spent junior year in Papua New Guinea, graduated summa cum laude, attended Yale Law, editor of Law Review, hired right out of law school by Swayze, Cummings, and Bass, made full partner in six months, elected president of the American Bar Association at the age of 26, appointed attorney general of the United States by President Halleck's Valgus, a post you left after a year to become a Supreme Court justice, a position which you in turn resigned after eight months to race Formula One cars in international competition, including the Monaco Grand Prix, which you won for three consecutive years. Very, very impressive, Desiree. Thank you, Mark. Desiree, what sort of position are you looking for with us? Something in security. As you can see, I've been in some dangerous situations, and I think that my experience will be a great asset to you and your staff. As I alluded to on the phone, I definitely think you need to beef up your security, and now. There are rumors out there about missing fiction workshop participants. Things could get rough. There was now positively no doubt in my mind that Desiree would be an invaluable addition to the staff at headquarters, and I made a note of my decision. Could you start tomorrow? Absolutely, she said, grinning. Good. We'll see you at 9 a.m. Report to Baby Lago, and she'll see that you get your W-2 forms and security pass and health insurance information and belt buckle. Okay? Desiree, I've got to get going now. Arlene's going to be worried about me. Welcome to Team Laner. I stood up, kissed her on the cheek, and threw some money on the table. Mark, th there's one more thing I want to talk to you about. Do you do drugs? It's something I think you might be interested in. I sat back down. Desiree, as you know, Mark Lehner is about total fitness and power, muscle mass, density, ripped definition, triceps, biceps, pecs, lats, glutes, intensity, stamina, endurance, mental focus. On the other hand, I do have a responsibility to my fans to forge ahead where most men fear to tread. I mean... We can't leave the exploration of inner space to New Age milk toasts like Terence McKenna. What kind of drug and how much? Well, it's not really a drug per se, although it'll get you off, believe me. And I don't exactly have it to sell you, but I know you'll be interested, and I know how you can get it. It's Lincoln's morning breath. What's morning breath? You know it's the worst breath of the day, morning breath. Lincoln's morning breath? Abraham Lincoln's morning breath? There's a vial of Lincoln's morning breath in the National Museum of Health and Medicine in Washington, D.C. I mean a snort or two, and who knows? I knew you'd be interested, Mark. Desiree. I think this is going to be a very profitable association for both of us. See you in the AM, babe. Joe Casal made the arrangements. We've got the first-class section of Continental Flight 213 to National Airport in Washington, D.C., all to ourselves. Arlene's wearing a chartreuse skating skirt with an ornate jeweled bodice and boots with jeweled cuffs. I'm wearing Air Jordans, camouflage pants, no shirt, an onyx quarter-pound burger embedded with chunks of diamond on a gold rope around my neck, and a black baseball cap with the words golden nugget in gold stitching. As we touch down and taxi toward our gate, I nudge Arlene and flash two White House press passes. You said you always wanted to go to a presidential news conference, right, babe? Oh, Mark, when, when? 
tomorrow morning, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Mr. President, there's been a tremendous amount of controversy recently about the size of the First Lady. At a briefing last week, your press secretary, in response to a question about how you first met her, said that you were at an after-hours club sitting next to a man who still had anti-shoplifting magnetic tags attached to his sports jacket and safari shorts. Now, the FBI is baffled as to how this man managed to leave the Harvey Bernard outlet in Tacoma Park with anti-shoplifting magnetic tags affixed to his clothes without setting off the store's alarm, but at any rate, your press secretary said that the man ordered a cocktail and then began playing Tetris on his Game Boy when, and I think you, sir, repeated this in a speech you made last Friday before the AFL-CIO, you saw something crawling out of his ear, and you reached over and took it between your thumb and index finger and, looking closer at it, discovered that it was a woman, a woman about the size of the letter O in a magazine or newspaper. I think you even indicated a point size, but uh, I don't have the transcript handy here. Your press secretary then went on to say that within the next 48 hours, you and the first lady were married. Could you fill in some of the details about what exactly transpired in the 48 hours between the time that you plucked the first lady from the ear of the man at the after-hours club and the marriage ceremony? First of all, let me say this. I think it's very important that people not lose confidence in our retail industry's anti-shoplifting magnetic tag program, and I have urged the business community to continue utilizing the program in order to curtail pilferage and avoid the need to pass along revenue losses to customers in the form of higher prices. Now, when Barbara crawled out of this fellow's ear, and I think I compared her size to that of an eight-point times Roman lowercase o, I didn't know what she was. I plucked her off this guy, who said absolutely nothing and just continued playing Tetris, held her in the light, and asked her what her name was. She said Barbara, and she asked me what my name was. I introduced myself, and then I said that it was difficult to talk here. Would she like to come back to my place? Now, I think it's critical here for people to understand that this wasn't the cliched bar pickup line it may appear to be. Because she was so tiny, it was extremely difficult to hear her. And with the jukebox blaring, it was impossible. When we got home, we talked and we talked, and it became apparent, I think, to both of us, that we were just in complete sync on every level, politically, philosophically, spiritually, and it was equally apparent that we were physically quite attracted to each other. Sir, you've recently urged Americans, and in particular poor Americans, to nutritionally supplement their food with their own hair and nail clippings. Could you expand on this? Our nails and hair are made out of a protein called keratin. Keratin provides us with a wonderfully inexpensive way to supplement the protein content of our family's diets. Using an industrial grinder, you simply pulverize the clippings into a fine powder. Then you can add the powder to soups, cereals, shakes, chopped meat, whatever. By incorporating pulverized hair and nail clippings into your family's recipes, you should be able to use 25% less beef and still exceed the U.S. recommended daily allowance for protein. When we got back to the hotel, Arlene was still quivering with excitement. Oh, man, what a thrill that was for me. Arlene, I'm going to the National Museum of Health and Medicine. Do you want to come? Nah, I think I'm going to take a nap for a while. Will you be long? I hope not, babe. I was back with the vial of Lincoln's morning breath in less than an hour. Security at the National Museum of Health and Medicine was a joke. The vial wasn't under guard. It wasn't monitored by surveillance cameras. It wasn't even kept in a locked vitrine. It was propped up on a table in the middle of an empty room. What do you think of this? I asked Arlene, handing her the vial. 
Arlene shrugged. Arlene, what you've got in your hand happens to be a vial of fucking Abraham Lincoln's morning breath, and it's my pleasure and honor as your husband to invite you to join me in partaking of a snort or two. Arlene looked at the vial. She looked at me. She looked back at the vial, and then back at me. Let's get stoned, she said. The psychoactive effect of Lincoln's morning breath was quite as astonishing as its aroma. I could easily devote the balance of this memoir in its entirety to detailing the 12-hour psychedelic joyride Gotterdammerung that Arlene and I experienced under the influence of the rancid vapor. But highlights shall suffice. Sex was intense. End of side two.